that's a lot of people. Hello, my name is Steve, and I have a confession to make. I'm a mathematician. You expected there was going to be a performance singing and dancing. Instead, you're going to get a math lesson. I'm sorry. The next question, how many people here speak English? Oh, shoot, I was hoping no one would understand me. <laughs> next question, how many of you studied math or engineering or physics or so? Oh, shoot. OK. So a disclaimer. I took a little bit of artistic license about some of these math concepts. Nobody yell out, that's not the definition of a derivative. I know. You know. Let it go. <laughs> so what I'm here to talk about is the things that I've learned from math that have influenced my life, that have helped me make decisions. Uh, because for me, math has always been a passion. It's been a love. To me, it's a language that describes our universe, not just our physical universe, but how we interact as people how we interact and how we react as organizations, as societies. Um, and if we want to be effective catalysts for change in those reactions, we have to understand the language of change. And to me, math has been the language of change, so I'm going to share that with you. I've been trying to share that with people for 30 years, and no one's believed me, so I won't be offended if you don't believe me. So the five things are, starting with what we learned in middle school about parallel lines and geometry, moving all the way up to what I did my master's degree in, which was complex problem solving. Let's see if we can do this in the next 12 minutes. Parallel lines, two lines running next to each other forever that never touch. Simple enough concept. To test if they are parallel, you put a line in between them and you check to see if there's a right angle to both of those lines. The problem is that they never taught us when we were 13 or 14 years old, is that that doesn't work in the real world. Lines of longitude and lines of latitude meet at right angles. They, everyone meets the equator at a right angle. But somehow the lines of longitude all meet up at the North Pole and the South Pole. Parallel lines don't actually exist in reality. So what does that teach us? Ideas are also never parallel. Ideas can always have a point of intersection if you look over the horizon long enough. At MC Egypt, Mercy Corps Egypt, we believe that the ideas of business and the idea of philanthropy are not parallel lines. They intersect. You just have to look over the horizon. We believe in supporting businesses that are going to help the poor, either with healthcare, income, education, whatever it is, but with a business approach taking from the advantages of the nonprofit sector helping people, the business sector, scalability, sustainability. So people always ask me, so Mercy Corps Egypt, MC Egypt, are you a for-profit or a non-profit? Are you a development organization or are you an investment company? My answer is very simple. You're asking the wrong questions. The real question is, what value do you plan to create? How do you plan to create that value? So the lesson from math is, it doesn't matter how parallel two ideas look, how different people are, if you look over the horizon, you can always find where they intersect. The next is what I call the happiness equation. How many people studied calculus? Great. I came up with this when I was in high school calculus, trying to understand what makes people happy. My belief is that what makes you happy or sad is the derivative of success, the derivative of experience. So if you look at this, when you're going up, that's when you're happy. If you were to ask me right now, if you have $2 million, would you be happy? Yes, I would be happy with $2 million. However, if I have $3 million, and you ask me again, would you be happy with $2 million? Probably not. What I thought about this was when I was a swimmer in high school, and when I was 17, I started getting really fast, and I was really happy. And then I had ups and downs like everybody else. By the time I was 22, I had a slump. My time started going slower. And I was not doing as well, and I wasn't happy. The problem was, I was still faster than when I was 17. So why wasn't I happy? The point is, we're happy when our experience and our success are going up. We're unhappy when they're going down. 
Another example that came up in my life was when I was about 25 or 26, I had a really good job. Uh, I was leading about 50 people, and my career path was going up. My leader sat down to me and said, this is what your path could look like for the next 20 years, and it was amazing. And they said I could do it, and they were going to help me do it every single step of the way. And then I could retire when I was 42. So why didn't I do it? The answer is I did do it in my mind. Once I had done it in my mind, there was no reason to do it in reality because that became the flat. That was my expected. I had to do something better than that. So what do you do when that happens? For me, I just gave up, quit my job, gave away all my things, except for my car. I sold my car because I had to eat. And I studied math, my real passion, for two years. So what did I get out of studying math? I got the ability to give you this speech. Actually, what I got was the realization that it doesn't matter where you're headed to. It matters what you're doing right now. Does what you're doing right now make you happy? Then do it. Are you following your passion right now? Then do it. Next. Distance is my favorite conversation. I love talking about distance. Most people have seen this slide before. The line between line to success. Let's think about this in a mathematical way. This is how most of us think about distance, Euclidean distance. The, high, the length of that hypotenuse, the, the distance from point A to point B or P to Q. Distance between places. The red line is, so this is my house in Zamalek and this is where we are right now. This is how I came here. I didn't take Euclidean distance. Some of you AUCNs might have taken your helicopters. I don't have one. What matters to me is Google distance, the blue line. Distance can mean lots of different things to lots of different people. Don't get focused on your one idea of distance. Because which was right, Euclid or Google? Neither. The distance is infinity to get here from Zamalek. Another idea about distance is called the discrete metric. Don't get too scared, this is not that complicated. It basically means if two things are in the same place, their distance is zero. If they're in different places, their distance is one. This was an idea I first started thinking about when I left home when I was 18, and I haven't gone back, well, just for visits. The distance between the two closest people in my life, my mother and my sister, and me, doesn't matter how many kilometers it is. All that matters is they're either next to me or they're not next to me. One or zero. So don't think about distance only in terms of how far something is. There are all kinds of different ideas about what distance is. Also, don't get too wound up on the idea that things are ones or zeros. I think everybody has felt people trying to say, you're either a one or you're a zero. You're either this or you're that. As an American, I can only talk about my culture, they would say either you're a Democrat or you're a Republican. You have no other options. You either believe this or you believe that. You're with this group or that group. So if the top there represents the Democrats and the bottom represents the Republicans, everybody says you can be all the different ones and zeros you want, but you have to be my code of ones and zeros. And you have to be against all of the other ones and zeros. The reality is actually something like this. Well, the Democrats and the Republicans, or any two groups, actually have a lot in common. And I don't agree with almost anything that they have in common. Don't be afraid to disagree with other two groups that are out there trying to say, you're either for us or against us. Amazing that that is the lesson you get from math. It's also the difference between solutions. Uh, let's see, about, we're finally up to master's level problem solving. Um, if you have a problem, so for my master's degree, I had to solve a problem called the warehouse location problem. The warehouse location problem basically says, if you have 20 possible locations for a warehouse, how many warehouses are you going to build, and how, where should you put them to make the most optimal, efficient distribution network possible? The problem is, your option is either put a warehouse or don't, one or zero. If you have 20 possibilities, that's two to the 20th power possible solutions. 
That's a million solutions. For my problem, it was actually 6,000 possible locations. The number wouldn't even fit on the screen of how many possible solutions that is. So the two main ways you can solve an optimization problem, one is called brute force. You try all of the solutions. You put enough resources at a problem, eventually you will solve it. It just takes a lot of resources. You put a lot of resources at a problem, you will solve it. It just takes a lot of resources. The main problem is what happens if the variables change? The road between Zamalek and Mahdi is blocked. Downtown is no longer a possible place for a warehouse. What do you do then? You have to run through the whole process again and again and again. And how much energy do you have for those types of problem solving methods? So we come to the final lesson. Genetic algorithms. This is how I solved the problem of locations for warehouses in Pakistan. Bear with me, this is a little bit complicated. If you take 100 of your possible billions and billions of solutions and you put them into what's called a population, you separate them into pairs, so you have lots of pairs of solutions, call them the mother and the father solution. You combine those pairs into a child solution. If the child solution is better than the parent solution, it replaces them in the population. And I know that's cold, nobody wants to replace their parents, we're just talking about numbers and warehouses. The result is that very quickly you get to an optimized solution. So if we look at it in terms of numbers, if the top solution is the mother, warehouse or no warehouse, the bottom solution is the father, warehouse or no warehouse, this is the resultant child. All of the things that they had in common get passed to the child. If both of your parents, parents have blue eyes, blue eyes, chances are you'll have blue eyes. Not in reality, but let's just pretend. If they're different, you take one thing from the father, one thing from the mother, one thing from the father, and so on. The problem with this solution is, what if the mother and father, neither of those solutions included a warehouse in 6th of October? But that was the best solution. You will never find it. Take another example. Original cell phones, and this is maybe before your time, but original cell phones, some of them had flat buttons, some of them had rounded buttons. They all had buttons. And it was like all of the manufacturers, Nokia and Motorola and, and Blackberry, were trying to find the optimal curvature of buttons, the optimal size of buttons, so that they fit our fingers. The problem is nobody bothered to ask, should they even have buttons? That's why we need mutations. Somebody has to come up and say, I don't think cell phones should have buttons. We should have touch screens instead. You have to have mutations in the system in order to come up with new and innovative solutions. The lesson from this is you have to have the patience to iterate solutions. You have to have the patience for evolutionary change. But you have to have the courage to look for mutations and look for revolutionary change. That is all I have.